Who do you voodoo? We do, the hex girls concluded in illusion. Excellent! Excellent! It's been wonderful to see you in the show this morning, girls, Chelsea exclaimed. And we're out, Jack informed. Thank you so much again for having us, Luna exclaimed. This was fun. You ready to go, girls? Bridget inquired. Yeah, we've got a very long way to Detroit, Nia brought it up. We're ready when you are, Foreign said, quickly putting her guitar back in its case. Shit! Dusk exclaimed. Everyone's eyes shifted over to see Dusk, who had just broken her drumstick in half. Damn it! Dusk swore. I accidentally broke my drumstick because I was rushing. Usually I'm more careful than that, so I don't know how that could have happened. Don't worry, Dusk. I know a music store in Detroit we could possibly run before the concert. Gus assured. Sorry, okay, Dusk said somberly. The blonde was trying to calm down, but she was clearly still frustrated with herself for making such a foolish mistake. Thank you again, Chelsea, for having us on the show, Gus appreciated as he headed towards the door. It was fabulous of you to invite us. It was my pleasure, Chelsea exclaimed. Have a safe trip, girls. Bridget had driven the entire six hours it took to get to Detroit, as Gus tried to make a few calls for work. Foreign smiled as she saw the sign which read, Detroit, population 950,000 nine, 950,000 950, seemed like a big number to Foreign, compared to less than a thousand people living in Oakhaven. Regardless, the black-haired goth was beginning to enjoy being in a new single city every night, even if it had taken her a little bit to get used to traveling. It was a lot of fun to explore the world. All right, that sounds wonderful. Thank you, Gus said as he hung up the phone. Well, girls, I just sent the order for your merch. They said it would be sent to us in five days, and then you can have give them out the concerts. Oh my gosh, I can't believe our faces are going to be on our t-shirts, Luna gasped. Foreign Quinn quite tell if Luna was excited or skeptical from her tone. However, Dusk's opinion was perfectly illustrated by her respective response. That's wicked, Dusk exclaimed. You seem super talkative during that interview, Luna. Foreign quickly turned the subject. Yeah, I guess I was. I just liked the idea of performing and talking to one person at a time instead of 3,000 fans at once, Luna admitted. Seriously? Dusk challenged. You rather just have one person love your music compared to that? No, it's not like that, Luna corrected. Well, what's like then? Dusk inquired. I don't even know. Luna had a blank look on her face as the tour rem van remained silent for a moment after that. It was clear that Luna was enjoying the tour less than Foreign and Dusk were. Even Bridget, Nia, and Sam seemed to be enjoying the tour more than Luna did. She supposed it was said, Gus said, that it would just take Luna a few more days. Just to adjust to touring life, at least Foreign hoped that it would be the case for Luna's sake. Here we are, girls. St. Andrew's Hall, Gus informed, as Bridget drove up to the venue where they would be performing tonight and parked the vehicle. The venue was a two-story brick building. Five picture windows provided the overlooks onto the city street from the second level, and the first level had to be two, two sets of free windows on either side. A large black sign, which read St. Andrews in gold letters, jutted out from the first right of the window of the first level. The building's entrance looked a little more emiscate. It had a large arch with some sort of resonance design carved on top of it. The two large lamps stood on each side of the orange front doors, looking bright as the torches. It looks beautiful, Born exclaimed. Dusk, the music store is just a few blocks away, Gus mentioned. If the rest of you want to get out there, I'm happy to drive Dusk over to get her new drumstick and then park it in front of the parking ramp. I'd love to go if you wouldn't mind, Luna interjected. I think it'd be cool to check out a music store around here. One in Oakhaven's nice, but it's so small. Be my guest, Dusk shrugged. Okay, we'll see you later, Forn said as she grabbed her instrument. Nia and Sam respectively look, took Luna and Dusk's instruments so they can all be set up for the time Dusk and Luna returned. They had really stopped for dinner at the Roma Cafe, which was apparently the oldest restaurant in Detroit since it had opened in 1890. Thus, they only had about an hour and a half left before the show and would need to ensure they were set up to start playing right away upon Dusk and Luna's return. 
Bye, thanks for signing up, Luna appreciated as Bridget got out of the van and Gus drove to the music store. Thorn had admittedly had been worrying worried during dinner as talking with Bridget loomed closer. The black-haired goth knew she had to do it sooner or later rather than later. But one part of her was that talking herself out of her without saying anything at all, she didn't want to create an awkward situation. Well, hello, welcome to St. Andrew's Hall, a refined man said in a British accent. My name is Jonathan. You must be the Hex Girls. That's us. Well, one of us anyway, Foreign backtracked. The other two were on their way. Dusk accidentally broke her drumstick this morning and... Jonathan cut her off, telling her that if he probably didn't care all that much about the stem sticks, why not? Three girls were here. Oh, that's quite all right. Right this way. The backstage area is on the second door to the end of the hall. Thank you so much, sir, Nia politely thanked. Whoa, Sam exclaimed. I think this St. Andrew's Hall was MMM first performed at. Indeed it was, ma'am. Um, Jonathan confirmed. Many of our fabulous artists have performed here. R.E.M., No Doubt, Paul Simon, Nirvana, the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan? That's amazing, Foreign gasped. She remembered back to their first meeting with Gus when she saw the Bob Dylan po Stir in the record studio and had wondered what it would be like to be famous like him. Now she knew. Maybe she hadn't quite have the Bob's Dylan's level yet but on fame, but the notion is just where they were performing at the same concert hall felt like a very every circle full moment. All of a sudden, a man wearing a black suit and jeans stumbled through the halls in the opposite direction. He looked to be drunk. Hey, pretty lady, will you marry me? He slurred his speech as he talked to Forn. Before Forn could respond, Jonathan spoke up. Sir, you'll have to leave, or I'll have to call the authorities and have you thrown in the drunk tank, Jonathan said, before shifting his attention back to the girls. I'm sorry about that. It's really best not to pay attention to people like that. No worries, Forn assured. She hadn't seen a number of drunk people like that at Lester's, so she was sadly not surprised by the drunkard's boorish antics. There's a backstage area. If you need anything, I'll be on the second floor, Jonathan said. Good luck tonight. Thank you, Forn appreciated. The backstage was somewhere between Turner Hall and Excel Energy Center, not as big as Minneapolis. But thankfully, it's not as small as Mill Lakes. This backstage area was pretty drab, and basically consists of a wooden floor, a curtain, and a few levers. It didn't look run down, but the lack of decorations made it seem quite basic. Foreign quickly realized that there was also a lack of something else. Hey, they didn't give us any microphones, Foreign observed. I could go find Jonathan if you want, Nia offered. I'm sure he for just forgot them. That would be great, Foreign appreciated. I could go. There's nothing else to do in this boring old place. Sam sighed. What about helping setting up the instruments? Nia questioned. Well, Bridget's here, isn't she? Sam pointed down in a joking way. It's fine, Bridget said. I could set up Dusk and Luna's instruments if Sam wants to be lazy. Well, as a matter of fact, I do, Sam smirked, as she and Nia departed backstage to find Jonathan. Foreign didn't feel quite ready to talk to Bridget yet, but she knew she wasn't going to get any better opportunity than this. Um, hey, Bridget... Forn asked, with lots of uncertainty evident in her voice. Yeah? Bridget chirped. Forn had to recompose herself to be more confident that she actually was. If Bridget was an obsessed fan, she didn't want to show any sign of invulnerability. Why were you in our room yesterday morning? I told you, silly, Bridget giggled. I forgot my makeup, so Dusk let me borrow some. Forn took a deep breath. Bridget's obsess made him or not to give up the whole thing. It would have been since it would have been easier. But Forn knew that if she kept worrying less, she would said something. No, you didn't, Forn challenged. I talked to Dusk yesterday, and she said that she didn't even know what type of makeup you wore. I didn't want to be picky. I was just upset about pick forgetting my makeup at home, but that didn't I take anything I could get. Bridget's voice stayed in a very kneeled conversational. She didn't seem nervous at all. My acne was pretty bad lately, and I don't want to be traveling around the city with my face looking like it's a pimple party. 
Why did Bridget have to make this so challenging? Ford wasn't going to drop the subject until Bridget stopped lying. Well, that would make sense, except Dusk said that you never asked her to borrow her makeup. Bridget let out a sigh. Honestly, I was so embarrassed having to borrow another girl's makeup that I never said anything. I just went up to your room and hoped Dusk would have been in her best friends with a lot of less awkwardness. Why didn't you just ask Nia and Sam? They both wear makeup. Ford questioned. That's when Bridget got really started blushing. Okay, you got me. I didn't want to say this, but I wasn't actually borrowing makeup. I forgot to bring my deodorant, and I was so embarrassed and I didn't want to tell anyone. It was clear that Bridget was spiraling. This excuse made it more or less sense than that, which confirmed foreign suspicions that she wasn't telling the truth. So your solution was to sneak into our room instead of running to the store and buying it? And you couldn't have just borrowed from Nia and Sam? Or did they forget their deodorant too? Bridget took a deep breath for a moment. I'm sorry, I really didn't want to tell you this or anyone this, but I'm in love with Dusk. I've been exploring my, well, sexuality for these past few months, and I feel like I've gotten smitten with her, and I think about her all the time. I wonder that it would be like to kiss her, and to be honest, I was going to go into her room to, well, see if I'm into women. This was certainly not what Foreign expected. It was so unexpected, the fact that the black-haired Jared Goff moment to process what she just said. That being in love with Dusk was an excuse was certainly odd, but Foreign didn't want to fully buy it. Perhaps if Bridget started with that story, Foreign could have believed it. But during to the fact that I had been taking these three different lies, to get there, the black-haired text girl questioned it. Ford wasn't entirely sure if she believed in that story, but she figured that there had to be no harm in continuing to challenge it. Bridget's track record with lying hadn't exactly been good, and was beginning to feel like she was just coming up with any excuse so she could think of a frenzied panic. If Bridget was actually telling the truth this time, she had to defend her story, but she changed its story again that Foreign would knew it's a lie. You're a terrible liar, Foreign finally spoke. I know exactly what you are, so don't give me any more bullshit lies. A metaphorical darkness fell over Bridget's face as a cute smile turned into a death glare. You have no idea who I am, Bridget hissed. I was fine playing with your little game of polite and questioning first, but you're starting to piss me off. So back off, bitch. This caught Foreign completely off guard. For a moment, she wanted to listen to Bridget simply drop the whole subject out of discomfort. But now, Four knew she couldn't do that, unless she wanted to worry about it for the rest of the tour and beyond. It took some courage, but once again, Four spoke. Yes, I do know who you are, Bridget. I've known it for a little while, and it took me a little while to come to terms with it, but I think it's something we need to talk about, Four stated, trying to make her voice seem less calmer than she felt. No, we don't, Bridget snapped. Leave me alone, and don't try to understand things that is none of your business. It is my business if you're breaking into our room and digging through my friend's stains without her permission. Foreign began getting defensive. We need to talk about it, and I'm not going to let you go in till, till you do. Whenever we're alone, I'm going to keep to bring this up until you tell me. It may seem harsh, but I am going to let my best friends and bandmates be unsafe because of you. And I'm not going to let that happen. Talk about it? Bridget's face lit up with rage. Okay, so you want to talk about how Nia, Sam, and I are evil witches who have been manipulating your music career this time so you'll become the world famous? Foreign let out a sigh. Bridget, there's no need to be drastic. You've helped us with a lot of our music career, and you, but you're just overstepped up a little bit with digging through our stuff thing. I mean, I know that you're the type of guy that is the type of crazy fans that are obsessed with us, but you really need to tone down and respect our boundaries, that's all. I would hardly say you're an evil witch. Before Bridget had a chance to respond, Foreign saw Gus standing by the entrance backstage area. The producer stood alone without Dusk or Luna, who the black-haired goth assumed that still they're still at the music store. Gus looked as if he'd just seen a ghost. What's the matter, Gus? Foreign asked, before quickly realizing he probably overheard part of their conversation. It was probably frightening to him, to realize his daughter was actually an obsessed fan who just dug through people's stuff. 
Gus, it's fine. I'm talking it out with Bridget and getting it under control. Don't know. Don't question them, Thorn. Gus looked absolutely terrified. As I said, you have no idea who we are. Bridget's face turned out from an angry glare to a creepy looking smirk, as if she almost saw a devil. I'm so sorry, Thorn. Gus broke down into tears. Just please, do whatever they say. They threatened to kill me if I didn't do everything you said. And they'll do the same to you. Oh my god. Thorne's body suddenly broke out in cold sweat. She felt a lump in her throat that she felt like she couldn't breathe. You'd kill your own father? Of course not. I'd kill Gusto if he was not if he's not my father, Bridget revealed. I only pretended so that he wouldn't seem natural, and then I had a connection to a record executive. Gus did an excellent job of playing the part for the past few months, even if it was against his will. Well, what do you mean? Thorne stuttered in terror. You mean just wondered why a little band in Okaven suddenly went from, from nobodies to world famous like in two months? You didn't actually think this was real, did you? Bridget cruelly laughed. I just thought we did a really great job making music, music people would relate to. Thorn meekly said. Bridget began cackling in response. Thorn felt so panicked that her first instinct was to run immediately, but if they threatened to kill Gus, they would have no in hesitation on killing her. That's what she realized. Bridget wasn't lying or being dramatic earlier. She, Nia, and Sam were actually evil witches who had been manipulating them the whole time. What do you want from us? Thorn asked, sounding completely helpless and terrified compared to her confident demeanor before. All I want for you is to keep your mouth shut, Bridget snapped. If you tell Dusk and Luna what we are, we will torture you in many ways you can't imagine. Kind of like this. Suddenly, Gus started coughing and gasping for air as Bridget pointed her arm at him, menacing look on her face. He couldn't breathe. Stop! Stop! Thorn shrieked. Okay, I won't tell Luna and Dusk. At that moment, Nia and Sam came backstage. Luna and Dusk were nowhere to be found yet, thankfully. Well, girls... Thorn figured out we're witches and that we've been manipulating them things to become famous, Bridget said. Don't worry, though. She's going to keep her mouth shut. Good, Sam sneered. We don't need any more of this, of our plans to uh, when we're so close. Oh, shut up, bitch, Bridget snapped before spinning around to Thorn. Just in case if you think about telling Luna and Dusk when we aren't around, you know the guy we saw in the hallway? The one that asked me to marry him? Thorn previously answered. Well, he should just go screw himself. He's probably just looking for attention. Bridget's evil smile grew bigger as she said each word. Thorn suddenly got icy goosebumps all over his skin. And that was ex the exact same wording of the thought that she had in her dream about fame. The dream that hadn't told anyone about. She wasn't exactly sure how these witches were manipulated and things. But it was clear that they somehow knew about her content and dream. Thorn didn't really want to know if they had somehow manipulated her into having that dream, or if they were just reading for her mind and thoughts. Both options were incredibly terrifying. Thorn still couldn't believe her fame was just a, some sort of supernatural manipulation by these witches, and she felt like she couldn't breathe. The thought of it made her even more sick than she ever was no choice, but to comply to lie in, to Luna and Dusk about all this. It was all hardly enough to having to lie about her two best friends in the world to protect them. But what made it worse was perhaps the most terrifying realization of them all. Bridget, Nia, and Sam had manipulated their entire rise to fame. None of this was real.